All right, 97.7 Outlaw Radio FM listeners, we got the one, the only founder of UNLV, a phenomenal artist of Cash Money Records. We got little Ya on the line. How you doing this evening? I'm great, man. What's up? What's up? How y'all doing? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. I've been looking forward to this interview, man. I'm going to be 100% honest with you there. I actually grew up on your music, so this is an absolute honor just to be able to welcome an individual like yourself on my radio station, so thank you so much. Appreciate the welcome, man. Appreciate it. So if you don't want me asking, y'all, like, what made you decide to get into the music industry? Oh, uh, well, I actually grew up around music all my life. Uh, my mom, my dad, we, we always listened to music around the house and stuff like that. I had a few famous uh, artists, actually, that played instruments that was in my family from New Orleans that played jazz music and stuff like that. And I was always in the bands. In high school, middle school, elementary, whatever, but I think rapping was my calling because I couldn't sing at all. You know, even though I could play almost every instrument in a band, I couldn't sing. And my uncle took a trip to New York when I was in like the eighth grade, and he came back and he turned me on to rapping. And I, I tried it, and I just fell in love with it, man. And when you said you grew up on jazz, did you ever like consider like uh, getting into jazz rather rather than hip hop, or was this hip hop was always that one thing you wanted to get into? Well, actually, I played jazz in, uh, in a concert band, and uh, you know we played. I played uh, trumpet, baritone, and cymbal in a band, but I, I never just thought about recording and sticking with jazz. And also, uh, as we already know, like all of us know, uh, you actually are uh, the founder and also member of UNLV. I have to ask you, how did you and the other members get connected? Like, what's the story behind that iconic formation? Well, me and Yellow Boy grew up since, like, the age of two and three. You know, he, he lived right around the corner from me. And we was always friends like close cousins. I met Tech Nine in the seventh grade. At, at senior high school, and we discovered in, in eighth grade that both of us had an interest in, in rapping, and we formed a group called the Sporty and Seed with my little sister. Yellow Boy wasn't actually in the group at that time, but me, Tech, and, and my little sister and my cousin Donald, we formed a group called the Sporty and Seed, and we used to rap about positive, like positive issues, like crack cocaine and stuff like that. And we want every talent show in the city, you know. And we also want a, 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 the biggest radio station, which was WYLD FM. Uh, we want a talent show, and we want a contract. But some kind of way, we didn't. We never did cut the record. You know, the contract was bogus, I'm gonna say. So years later, after that, when we get, got ready to get out of high school, we started back rapping in the twelfth grade. And we started like doing a different type of rap. It was bounce at the time that was taking off in New Orleans. So we just changed the bounce to the gangsta bounce and added yellow in the group, you know, and took off from there. And also from 93 to 96, uh, you guys was at, were actually signed to Cash Money uh, Cash Money record label. I have to ask you, how did you get con- how did that record deal come to be for you guys, and what was it like actually being signed to Cash Money? Well, it was from 90, 92 to ninety seven, actually. My apologies. And, and the experience was was wonderful. You know, I I, I took my hat off to Baby and Slim. They, they taught us a lot. You know, we always wanted our own. That was a big goal to have our own record label one day. So we we rolled it. We we rolled it. Was their first group that that signed to them. We actually was the group that they got the deal off our numbers. We sold like three hundred fifty thousand copies independent, which enabled them to get the deal with Universal. You know, once they got the deal with Universal, you know, the, the, we went to finding out that the business wasn't all the way straight, and we we wanted out, even though they had the deal already. We wanted out and. Figured that we could get our own because we basically built cash money, right? And I do want to say, actually, on that, I, I, when I was, I actually told you this when we were actually just 
talking privately on the phone, but I do have to say, I really do think that UNLV really was the actual like major start of cash money. You know, when people think cash money, a lot of individuals think Lil Wayne and whatnot, but I want people to realize that individuals like yourselves came way before, and you guys really made a positive impact on that record label. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lil Wayne was, wasn't even, even mentioned when we was at Cash Money. I mean, when we started Cash Money, he was like, he was already young, but when he got like to be like 11 or 10 years old, Lil Slim introduced him to Lil, Lil Slim introduced Lil Wayne to Baby, and that's when he came aboard on, you know, on Cash Money. But we was there long before all Lil Wayne, you know, the High Boys and all, and all the other artists, even Juvenile. I got Juvenile signed to Cash Money, you know. Also, Pimp Daddy. If y'all familiar with Pimp Daddy, you know, I was the reason that they signed to Cash Money. And also, um, I also read that you introduced uh, Pimp Daddy, BG, and Juvenile to Cash Money Records. Um, I have to ask you, how did you get the, those individuals connected with Cash Money? Like, how did that all come to be? Well, Juvenile and Pimp Daddy used to rap in, uh, in Club Newton's. That was the first club that we started rapping at. It was like a local chitlin' scene in New Orleans and a lot of local rappers would come out and rap at. And we knew those guys from the club, and also they stayed in our area. And Juvenile was the first to get us get really get on with DJ Jimmy, but his deal didn't work out or whatever. So later, like maybe three, four years later, we got on with Cash Money, and he was free. And you know, he told me that he was he was interested in signing with us. So I brought him to the office and let him rap for Baby and Slim, and you know, they, they loved it. You know, for his pimp daddy, pimp daddy wanted to be with us too, but he was already in contract with a with a group called with a record label called Full Pack. Shouts out to the late Fest and Don Juan. You know, and and baby just took as his um uh, his lawyer fees and sent me to the to the courthouse with him to make sure everything was straight. You know, that's how pimp daddy got signed to Cash Money. And for his BG. BG, I was I was I played a recording role in that too, because BG mom knew me real well, she knew my family well, and she was still convinced that Baby and Slim was drug dealers on the street and they wasn't really pushing music and stuff like that. But I enticed her, and you know through evidence of what we were doing, she finally let him sign with her. And also, uh, in 93, you, uh, UNLV actually released their debut album called Six and Bar One. I have to ask you, what's the inspiration behind that iconic record? Actually, it's Six and Bar One. The inspiration was, as, as, as a matter of fact, that's the name of the, our hood. A, a street that's in our hood is called Six and Bar One. We used to hang on that street every day, all day after school, and also before school. And we will just beat on up. On, on the side of the house, stuff like that, and bust, you know, rap along, rap around each other all the time and stuff like that. So we decided to name our first album Six and Barone. And I also read something on the internet as well that, like, originally, like, when that album got released, uh, it was only released locally, but then once Cash Money actually blew up, the record actually, like, got redistributed. Um, if you don't mind me asking, like, um, how, how were the numbers for from before versus after it got redistributed? Well, the first the first single which we are talking about, that was Another Trick. The, the street name was Another Bitch. We released that on our own. Back then they had cassette tapes. And what we did, me and Tech, was the only rappers on that song. We actually went to a guy called T-Bone House and, and you know, went, went over a track with him that we wanted. And once we got the track, the dude's right, we started making tapes, and we'll sell a tape for five dollars a pop. Baby and Slim got hold of one of those tapes, and they set up a meeting with us. And once we had the meeting, then we talked about what, what else we had or whatever. So what they did was they re-released another trick, just like that as a single, and also put that on our first album, Six and Barone, with them. But you know, I do have to say, at least that single actually got got a chance to be heard 
even further, you know, at least they actually put it on the record and... Yeah, and they know. put it on the radio and, and they put it all over the, uh, the South. It was just in, in uh, all over Louisiana and it touched the tip of Texas, like in Houston and Orange, stuff like that. So it, it enabled us to get our name going outside of Louisiana. And also, uh, three years later in 96, uh, you guys also released the album uh, called Uptown for Life, with a which actually featured a diss song called uh, Drag Him in the River, directed towards Mystical. I have to ask, did you guys ever, you know, uh, squash that beef with Mystical? And if you don't mind me asking, well, what was that all about? Well, the, the beef with Mystical really was a host. I mean, it's something that he wanted to do because he had just got out of the service and we was on the top of the pile in New Orleans during the time. And he knew us from high school. So he came and asked me about doing a disc record against us. And, and, and he wanted us to do one back at him. We really didn't pay no attention because it didn't make noise, the first one. But he came back with another song. Uh, I think it was, uh, uh, yeah, I go or something like that. Uh, I'm not that nigga or one of them songs. But anyway, we paid that attention and we came back and we dissed him. We put two kiss records on that Uptown for Life album. One was called Dragon from the River, and one was called Boom Get Shot. So the beef never was really real. It was never no beef at all. Not with us in this And you know what? Sometimes, you know, to, to get both careers popping off, sometimes you got to do stuff like that. You know what I mean? It's like the kayfabe of the music industry almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny. It's funny that it, it, it worked on for both of us, actually. And the guy to say, you guys both like you guys both had like a luxurious careers within the music industry, man. So I gotta say, it most definitely worked. And you know, um, any 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 uh, any people that are listening, they should probably take some notes because you know you're hearing it from the legend himself. Yeah, oh yeah, it's real. We have a, a documentary out right now on on YouTube. It's called UNLV: The True Legendary Story, and I talk about all that on that. I talk about the beef. And Mystical is even on a documentary. And he's talking about it, too. And also, in 99, you actually released your solo album called Another Massacre. I have to ask you, what made you decide to go solo? And what's the story behind that amazing record? Well, what happened was, Tech Nine went to, went to prison. Yellow Boy was murdered in 97. And I was the only member that was left on the street. And everybody was like, Man, what's up with you and LP and this and that? So I figured that if I put a solo album out, it would at least keep our name alive and establish myself as a solo artist, which it did. And I, I went to San Antonio with a, a hookup from a guy called Gregory D. He's one of New Orleans pioneers. Gregory D. hooked me up with a guy named Racine in, in San Antonio. I went out there for three months, and I recorded my album. It was produced mainly by Rusty and T-Bone. The, the T-Bone is the same guy that made another trick single for us, you know? So I went out there and, and done a solo album, and it did exactly what I had planned on it doing. It kept our name alive. That came home like a year later, and I still had a buzz going on my solo album. So it made it easier for us to, you know, get together and come out with a new UNLP album. And I have to say, that album was absolutely phenomenal as well, you know. I, I still have my CD copy after all the years, man. And I have to say, my favorite track is actually number four called I Don't Give a Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> that was me and a guy called Lil C. Actually, Lil C was like 15 at the time. And he was signed, all the time was me and my uncle's label. And Lil C was signed to us at the time. So I could speak to him and, you know, try to get him some exposure and help him out. At the same time, the song was a nice hit. And I remember that song was also featured by a guy named uh, S S uh, Vernon as well. Uh, who? Uh, Vernon, uh, Ca Castle, uh, Castle, oh, yeah, sorry? Vernon, Vernon, right. Fight on the body. Vernon, he done like two tracks on that, right. I have to say, he did a phenomenal, phenomenal job actually producing that. If you don't want me asking, like, what was it like actually working with that particular New Orleans producer? Oh, man, it was, it was, it was awesome, man. I had a great time. 
it was my first time working with somebody besides T-Bone and Manny Press with different producers. And, you know, it, it, it was nice. It came out. Every every producer that I worked with on that album seemed like we had chemistry for years. And it was my first time working with them. So I enjoyed it, and, and the chemistry was there automatically. And also, like, after uh, leaving Cash Money Records, you and LV actually went on a hiatus. Um, in 2001, you came back with the album The Return of UNLV, uh, Trendsetters. If you don't mind me asking, what made you guys decide to, like, you know, go on hiatus? And, you know, uh, what was it like actually being back in the studio? Well, like I said, Tech was locked up. And I couldn't do a UNLV album by myself. That is and true. Even though it was original two members, which was me and Tech, and we added Yellow Boy and made us a three-man group, I, can't, I couldn't do a UNLV album by myself. That's why I named it Lil Ya of UNLV, Another Master. And that is most definitely true, you know what I mean? It can't be UNLV when there's more than one member. Right, right. So that was my reason for doing that. You know, it set us up for, for a, a drink set of help. It was a, it was, we sold like maybe 50,000 units independent, which was real good. It would have done way, a lot better than that, but the distributor closed down. Oh, that's not good. They closed down right at the height of the hill. And also in 2012, so jumping ahead a little bit, you actually released an amazing mixtape called Hood Mac Mentality. I have to ask you, where can is that uh, mixtape still available on the internet? And where can our listeners actually uh, download themselves a copy? Yes, it's all uh, on that tip for free. You can you can download it off that tip at any given time. I also have four videos for that album on YouTube. And also, as you mentioned uh, earlier on in the interview about the documentary, so June 19th of this year, so not too, not too long ago, you actually released a documentary film on YouTube called UNLV, The True Legendary Story. Can you tell us a bit more about that documentary? And it is, and, and it, sorry, is it available on DVD as well, or is it just strictly YouTube? It will be available on DVD, but not right now. It's only on YouTube right now. Netflix, I'm in talks with Netflix about it, you know. And it's basically a tell-all story about UNLV. It's about how we was created, what we've been through, the things we've been through. And actually, there's a, there's a part two coming to it. I only, I, I'm the only one, only artist that's, well, only rapper from UNLV that's, that's speaking on this one because of tech incarceration. But he will be released soon, and we, we will get a part two of that documentary. And if you don't mind me asking, um, what what is next for you? Is there anything I happen to miss during this interview? Anything else you would like to promote? We still have you here live on the radio? Well, actually, uh, me and a guy named Bees of the Beast, we just put out an album that I would like everybody to check out called Big Boy. It's a, a fresh, fresh, Fresh breath of air. You know, it's, it's a lot of different type of material on there. You know, we work with different uh, producers, and we have two videos so far on there. We just put the album out maybe a month ago. And also, me and Tech are, are in, in talks about a new UNLV album once it's released. You will be getting a new UNLV album for months. And the movie is also in the, in the works. And as for the uh, new UNLV record, I know you probably can't release too much details currently right now, but what can our listeners expect from that when it does get released to the general public? You can expect our flavor. I mean, we never changed up our style because we never got complaints about it, and everybody still love our style. I find that when we put out new music ever since, like, maybe 2003 when we put out... uh, Keep it gutter. A lot of people was on our back saying, man, we, we want the old UNL, we want the old UNL or whatever. So what we did, we went back to our roots with this album. You know, we got one single so far. It's called True Colors. We have like five songs recorded, but we only released one right now. We, when we come home, we may like just distill the other full songs or we may put it on the album also. 
so that True Colors is on, on your on your platforms right now, your digital platform. You can check that out. And also, uh, Six and Barone will be going up on a digital platform real soon, along with all our other help. And so, little yeah, this is the time in the interview that I give a chance for the individual that comes on the radio station. Uh, just a chance to give shout-outs to whomever they want to give shout-outs to. And if you can, drop them social media handles as well. That way our listeners can follow you if they're not already doing so. No doubt. I want to send a shout-out to y'all first of all, man. Appreciate y'all having me. You know, I, I want to send a shout-out to my city, New Orleans, which I love so much. You know, I want to send a shout-out to Texas, where I reside at now. I live in Houston. I want to send a big shout-out to Texas. Uh, you can find me on on uh, on Instagram at Lil Ya U N L V three. That's L I L E N L V three. Facebook, you can find me on Ya Pet. That's Y A P H A T U N L V three. Uh, I'm not on I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on any other social networks. That's the only two social networks that I'm on right now. And I gotta say, little yeah, just thank you so much again for coming up on 97.7 Outlaw Radio FM. Like I said before, I grew up listening to your music. You know, your music made a positive impact on my life and and also millions around the world. So thank you so much for years of amazing hip hop. And I hope down the road we can actually do this again and have you back on the radio. No doubt, no doubt. And, and I, at the same time, hopefully you can call me with something out. That's the work, man. Come to some shows out there, or something, man. I'm dying to see Canada. <laughs> hey, man, you know what? When these borders open back up, you know, I'm going to tell you this when we're live. I haven't announced this at all on my radio station, but I'm trying to put together an Outlaw Radio Live Festival is what I want to call it, like a couple days, and showing my country real hip-hop, you know, not not mumble, real hip-hop. So that's my goal. So if all things go well, I, I most definitely you're on the list to actually book to come out here. Cool, man, cool. That's wonderful. That's a blessing, man. Hey, man, you know what? I, I still I look at it like this. Your definition of real hip-hop, man, and I really want people to realize and see that individuals like yourself are still here, still making great music for for the hip-hop. So that, that, that's my goal, man. So I hope we can have another interview, and I do hope that we can bring you bring you out here to Canada as well. Anytime, anytime, man. You need me for an interview, concerts, or whatever, you got my personal number to hit me up, man. I'm here. Hey, most definitely. You got my personal number as well. You need anything, don't hesitate to hit me up as well. Thank you so much, little. Y'all have yourself a wonderful night. Uh, you too, man.